everyone, welcome to the Christian Health Service Corps Iron to Silver podcast. We hope this will be a resource for you. We hope it will be your source for insightful conversations with expert guests in the area of global health, patient safety, and improving quality of care in low and middle income countries. Join me, Greg Seeger, Christian Health Service Corps founder, and Dr. Sarah Pruitt and Dr. Kelly Frazier as we share stories and explore strategies to improve healthcare in low and middle income countries. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Christian Health Service Corps' new podcast. This is our first episode, and because of that, we don't exactly have a name yet. (laughs) Hopefully, by the time you see this, we will have a name, and maybe you could send us an idea for it. But today, we are joined with some awesome guests, all CHSE staff, including Greg Seeger, our founder and CEO, and the author of When Healthcare Hurts an evidence-based guide to best practices in global health projects. And we have doctors Kelly Frazier and Sarah Pruitt, their CHSE staff, and the founders of Iron to Silver, which is an initiative to improve the quality of care in mission hospitals all around the world. Guys, it's so great to be here on our first episode of this podcast. It's going to be about best practices and medical missions and so much more. Could you each introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about what you do, what you've done? Sure. Who wants to go first? I guess, I, I guess it's me then, huh? Well, uh, as you said, Carter, I, uh, my name is Greg Seeger. I am a nurse by training, actually. I uh, also trained as a nurse practitioner at one point, but have done mostly administration for the last portion of my career, especially since we founded this organization. Uh, I did write the book, When Healthcare Hurts. Uh, and, and as an organization, that is really... Uh, I think something that we identify and resonate with a lot is is that idea of best practices. It's about how do we improve quality in the care that we provide uh, in global health and medical missions uh, in international health care. So that's something that when we started talking about this podcast, we all thought was pretty important. So uh, that's who I am. And uh, I'm excited finally to actually launch this podcast because it has been coming forever. We've been talking about it for a couple of years now. And uh, actually, this is kind of a gathering of the hosts of this, right? So sometimes you're all going to hear from me. Sometimes you're going to hear from Dr. Kelly Frazier and Dr. Sarah Pruitt. Uh, I'm still not used to those names, guys. I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. So uh, you'll have to explain that. You both recently changed your names, which is really totally messing me up. But uh, so I'm going to pitch it off to let them tell you a little bit about who they are. Um, Hi, my name is Dr. Kelly Frazier, formerly Dr. Kelly Faber. For those of you who uh, might have come across um, my paths on the mission field before, um, by training, I am a um, pediatric hospitalist uh, that trained in Louisville, Kentucky before going overseas initially as a post-resident to southern Togo, West Africa, and then moving to the 1040 window to help open the Hospital of Hope um, with another organization. and was there in Togo for a total of just under uh, 10 years before uh, coming home and uh, joining CHSC in order to launch this new uh, program called Iron to Silver along with uh, Dr. Sarah Pruitt. So I'm excited to be here. Hi, my name is Dr. Sarah Pruitt. That may be the first time I've ever said it that way because I just got married a month ago. So I don't think I've ever introduced myself as Dr. Sarah Pruitt before, um, but um, that's it now. And um, Sarah Cates was my former name. Um, I'm emergency medicine trained by uh, by training. I trained at Geisinger Health System in Danville, Pennsylvania. And then I spent about five years uh, practicing emergency medicine in the Atlanta area before uh, going over to um, Togo, Africa as well. Prior to that, I did a lot of short-term stuff um, all over the world, probably 25 different countries before Togo, uh, doing anything lasting from two to three weeks to um, three months. Um, Mostly outpatient clinic, but some hospital, some... um, other things. But, um, and then I joined the team in Togo, opening the Hospital of Hope in Mongo, uh, Togo with um, Kelly Frazier. And I spent a total of about six years there um, 
doing a little bit of everything except surgery, um, but um, helping run the hospital, help um, not uh, just being an attending in the hospital and, um, you know, providing care from pediatrics to geriatrics. So that's me. Awesome, guys. Uh, I, I don't know uh, Dr. Kelly and Dr. Sarah that well, so it's great to hear a little bit more about what you guys do. Uh, we're going to hear a lot more about it as this episode goes on. My name is Carter Mize. I'm not a medical professional, so maybe some of the other non-medical people that listen to this podcast might resonate with my perspective a little bit, um, but I'm the communications coordinator for CHSC. Um, I'm coming as at this as a young former reporter. So uh, I'm here to ask questions and learn a bit more. Um, and guys, I'm super excited about what this podcast will become. This is a production of Christian Health Service Corps. And if you're listening to this um, and you don't know what CHSC is, we deploy Christian health, uh, healthcare professional staff and volunteers to combat the overwhelming healthcare challenges faced by those living in poverty around the world. Uh, we send people all across the world to different mission hospitals, trying to improve the state of Christian healthcare wherever we can. Um, and if you are considering anything in medical missions, you can explore long-term and short-term opportunities in our network of over 30 partner hospitals across five continents by visiting Health Service Corps, that's C-O-R-P-S dot org slash volunteer. Uh, but we're hoping this podcast is something that's really informative for people who are interested in best practices in global health. Whether you're Christian or not, it really doesn't matter. We all have a heart for improving healthcare here, I think. So um, we're hoping that around twice a month, we'll get interviews with leaders and volunteers in global health on a wide range of topics. Um, could you guys go into maybe some of your goals for uh, what this podcast can become? Like, why why are we putting this on? Greg, I'll start with you. Well, you know, I think I mentioned, kind of br briefly mentioned it already, was how do we, uh, y you know, that idea of not just going and doing good good works, but how do we do that in, in from a Christian perspective in a way that really uh, honors and glorifies God to from from our perspective? But it's, it's more about, uh, we believe that the quality of healthcare that we provide is, is part of our Christian witness. Now, when I look back in, in history, what, what many people forget, it was Christians that actually founded healthcare. We started it. As early as 369 AD, the first mission hospital or the first hospital to care for the sick and the dying was erected. And, and those kind of that history we've kind of shied away from. And, and I, I think that I, I think we would like to shed a little bit of a light on that idea that there is some amazing healthcare professionals serving, motivated by their faith, serving around the world in so many different locations. Uh, but it's, you know, how do we take that next step and bring up the quality healthcare that we provide? And I'm going to pitch that to Dr. Kelly and Dr. Sarah because. I think they've got some really great perspectives on that. Yeah, I am excited about this podcast. Um, it's just even from a practical level of, uh, I, I know personally as a, as a worker overseas, you want to be doing your best. You want to give your best to, to these people that we're serving every day. Um, and some of it is not for lack of desire, or, um, but some of it's just lack of time. Um, it's it's hard to trudge through uh, the WHO standards of care at night after you've been working an 18 hour shift or even a 30 hour right. shift or on for seven days and um, want to make something that's tangible that somebody can listen to quickly and know what resources are out there, not waste time in resources that aren't going to help them. Um, a lot of resources that people look up are made for the first world and the gold standards, and they don't know how to apply them to their situation and where they live. Right. Um, so we're, we're hoping this could really be a place where people can touch base quickly uh, and apply information quickly uh, to where they're at to begin to change standards of care um, quickly and effectively. Yeah, I think I'm super excited about this as well. Um, 
we've talked about it ever since uh, we came on board with CHSC about getting a podcast going, which has been almost two years ago. And um, so it's exciting in this um, that to have something, as Kelly said, to give people a touch point on global health that's quick and um, pertinent to what's going on in their life. Uh, we're not talking about ECMO here in the, in the first world. We're talking about, you know, what you can do to make your practice better today, you know, and, um, you know, and I think those are important topics. Um, as Kelly said, it's, it's tiring. It's hard. It's, um, it can beat you down working, um, in an LM LMIC country. And it just, to have something that to go to, I think is, uh, would, would be refreshing. I would have loved to have had something like this, um, when I was working, um, in, in a different part of the world. Uh, one of my goals also, I think is just that this would become a place for collaboration, so that, you know, whether we can become a network and connect um, medical missionaries around the world, I think there's not enough of that. Um, I think there's amazing work happening around the world, but I don't think we share what's working a lot with other people, not because of lack of desire, just out of lack of means. And that would be a goal that I would have for this is that we can make some type of network to where we can start connecting people um, and, you know, start sharing ideas back and forth about how to do the best care in our settings. It's a great point, Sarah. I think we, I, I think one of the things that sometimes missed in the medical missions world or even the global health world is that idea of how does development fit in and what does it look like to, to, to do health system development and work in a process where, where the system is growing, it's improving. And that's something I think is an organization that we're very focused on, right? Our organizational mission is, is about building local capacity for quality healthcare. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, as we bring in people that are within our network and within our, you know, within our world of medical missions and global health in academia, I think we'll find some really good opportunities to, to, to get those pearls out there of how do we improve practice like in neonatal care? How do we improve maternal health outcomes? How do we do real strategic health programming at the level that we're doing it and even beyond uh, and help people see what that really looks like? Because when you're first stepping into medical missions or stepping out as a volunteer, that world is, is totally new. And I think that with, uh, you know, the experience of, you know, these hosts here uh, and, uh, you know, all of the folks that we know in and around the medical mission world, I think uh, I think this will be a pretty informative podcast, or at least I'm I'm hoping it will be. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, these are all uh, great things. And I think that we'll hear a lot more about all of these things that you touched on, you know, in the in the coming weeks and months where we hopefully keep putting on this podcast. Um, but let's get into it. You know, we've already touched a little bit on uh, healthcare and low resource places and, and settings. So I wanted to pitch this like open question to all of our panel of hosts here. Um, what do you guys see as the top three areas of need for quality improvement in healthcare and low resource settings right now? Uh, for me, I think just the number one uh, thing is just realization. I, I guess um, I know that we all want to believe that we're always giving the best quality care we possibly can as health professionals. Um, and it's a really hard pill to swallow to think or to even imagine that the, the care we're giving may not be the best quality. Um, mm. But you know, I recently read a statistic that said 15% of deaths in low and middle income countries are caused by low quality care. Uh, that is a sobering statistic. And it's actually more deaths are due to poor quality care than lack of access to health care. And a lot of us are motivated to go overseas because we feel this pull of that millions of people around the world have a lack of access to health care. Um, but all of a sudden, we realize that delivering poor quality is actually killing more people 
than the people that don't have access to health care at all. And that is a hard pill to swallow for us as medical professionals. Um, and especially those of us going overseas and practicing um, maybe medicine that's not a gold standard, saying that maybe it's easier. You know, they only have so many medicines. Um, but it's a responsibility that I think we uh, need to hold dear to us and all maybe take a step back as those engaged in global health um, across the board in global health and say, when should we intervene? <laughs> and maybe we should only intervene when we know we can deliver a quality um, product because something sometimes is more dangerous than nothing. Yeah, let me just tag on to what um, Kelly just said. I had that had read that same statistic or that same uh, uh, thought just a, a couple of days ago. Uh, and it said, just to put a number to 15%, that's somewhere between 5.7 and 8.4 million deaths are attributed to poor quality of care each year. That's an astronomical number when you think about it. Um, and this is in low and middle income countries. Um, and that's just, it's a sobering number to think about that many deaths are uh, directly attributable to poor quality, not access like um, Kelly was talking about. So yes, I think knowledge would be another word I would use, um, you know, um, knowing what to do and knowing what not to do and being able to know the difference of that is, um, is a big thing. Um, you know, and when you're talking about low income, middle, uh, middle income countries and resource limited settings, like knowing what to do and being able to do it in your setting are sometimes very vastly different. Um, you know, everybody knows how to do, I don't know, every ER doctor knows how to innovate somebody, but if I don't have a ventilator, then that means nothing. So then what do I do for this person in respiratory distress? You know, and being able to tailor your practice in a, in a resource limited setting is hard when you're coming from America where everything is available all the time. And all of a sudden you're not in that situation anymore. And then how do you pivot in those situations? Yeah. Yeah. And for those who are listening, practicing in the United States, um, just know that, uh, one in 10 deaths in America are also due to medical error or poor quality. So wow. we are not, um, we are not free. Um, this, this is not a low middle income country problem. Wow. Um, this is a, a, a healthcare problem that needs to be addressed no matter where you're practicing care. We're not picking on low and middle income countries. This is a problem everywhere. Yeah. I think we can really, uh, I think we can really speak to that, uh, in, on the field uh, as a, a, you know, there's, I want to say probably a quarter of a million medical volunteers that go overseas every year, uh, stepping into, uh, a, you know, a low and middle income country to provide some level of care, whether it be at an institutional level or at the community level. Uh, I think one of the things that we have to remember in that context is we can't leave all the safety uh, standards that we follow here just naturally on the airplane. Uh, that's a big step in the right direction. When we prioritize safety, patient safety, and healthcare quality, you know, it sets a great example for our, our national colleagues. Uh, and, and I don't want to pin all of those statistics on, you know, certainly on Christian hospitals. Most of the government hospitals are extremely under-resourced, but the Christian hospitals, we have to own some of that as well. We have to put our, uh, our focus on quality as much as, you know, the, the public hospitals do as well in the government facilities. We have to keep the quality of care we provide at the top of, you know, at the top of the list uh, even over the quantity of patients we receive, you know, Kelly mentioned one of the big things that I talk about in my book is that, you know, something is not always better than nothing, right? Mm -hmm. If the something has potential to harm. So we have to, we have to think these things through. And I, I hope that we never want to discourage people from going. That's not at all. We want to prepare people to go and step into this context with their eyes wide open in a way they can really be the most helpful they possibly can. Mm -hmm. 
That's a good point, Greg. So we talk about realization of, you know, the need for better quality care and the knowledge of how to provide that even when we don't have the things that we need in low resource settings. And, and on that note, what are some of the barriers that you guys are seeing in improving healthcare in low resource settings? What are, what are some of those roadblocks that you faced maybe in, you know, in your practice? I think even, I mean, Kelly, uh, yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Kelly. I was going to just piggyback on that. It's time, right? It's time and energy um, and the willingness and effort by, if you're talking about the missionary and the missionary um, uh, hospital setting, I mean, um, there isn't any of any of the above, right? I mean, to spare when you're talking about working the schedules that most of us work when we're there, you know, and it's just, I think um, something else I wanted to just min- uh, mention briefly is that um, it's a word, this is a term that's gotten a lot of um, play here recently, and rightly so, moral injury um, has become a really big term in like the trauma and resilience um literature and talks and things like that recently. And it's um, something that even we used to talk about on the field in Togo was, you know, and the the definition of moral injury is me having to do something that is inherently against one of my core beliefs, having to make a decision against that. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen in the States during um, healthcare. It does, especially in the ER. There's things I can't do that I want to do, but it happens every day in mission hospitals, delivering care in low resource settings, there's times that I can't do something that I believe to be the right thing to do. Um, And that person, I'm injured by that. Uh, You know, maybe not today and maybe not tomorrow, but that's going to build up and injure me to a point of burning me out, pulling me off the mission field, um, making me not not nice to be around, (laughs) or um, it's going to affect my family and friends and it's ultimately going to affect my care and my my delivery of care. And I think um, that is a huge barrier um, to people practicing in, in low resource settings is this idea of moral injury and how do you overcome it? How do you recognize it's happening? Because it is happening, <laughs> whether you recognize it or not. And how do you cope with it and deal with it to a point that you can thrive in, in the setting that you're thriving in? Um, so that's one of the things I think is as a like big... a future podcast topic to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it does indeed. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that I, I think that we're probably going to have a dozen or so episodes on what you just said uh, <laughs> coming up in the future. Yeah. Um, Kelly, Greg, what, what are some of the barriers that you guys are seeing um, towards improving healthcare in low resource settings? Uh, yeah, like as I was going to say time as well. Um, just the feeling uh, like the idea of a QI project or what that would entail just feels insurmountable and um, and just too difficult um, in the amount of time. And, you know, you, you just think if I have the choice to go to work and stop that, mala- you know, cerebral malaria child from seizing or sit down and do a chart review, you know, surely, <laughs> surely everyone would rather help the child seizing. Um, And I think that's, you know, one of our passions too, where Sarah and I's uh, project, Aaron De Silver is trying to come into play is, um, and, you know, and Sarah even talking about how we can have a better collaborative across missions, hospitals, or just global healthcare workers of saying, hey, maybe there's some of us that do have time or passion or ability or knowledge, and and we want to um, come alongside some of these places and either say, number one, you can do it. You can do it. Let us set up the parts that feel overwhelming to you and, and give you tangible things that you can do on the field. Um, and how do we partner together to relieve some of that burden? Um, because I really don't think it's desire. Um, I don't think it's a lack of noticing that care could be better. I think nationals and uh, global health workers alike um, recognize we wish our care could be better no matter what stage it's at everyone wishes it could be better um and i i i 
say that to myself as practicing in the United States now as a hospitalist. Sometimes I walk away and I'm like, gosh, I, I wish we could have done better for that patient. Um, so I, I, I think that the barriers are, are there, but they are, um, they are surmountable. And I hope that's what this podcast can show people that these aren't insurmountable things. Um, I think we just all need to link together to, to make the right connections to make it happen. Mm. We've addressed those concepts from the inpatient level. What does it look like to volunteer or serve in a long-term hospital? And how do we, you know, how do we think that through as far as, you know, eliminating some of those barriers? But there's this whole other group of people going into medical missions and global health service learning projects that do a lot of community-based care. And I think in, in those contexts, one of the biggest challenges is the fact that they set up in a church or a school or, a, you know, you know, in a, in a place that wasn't ever designed for healthcare, right? Mm. And, and those kind of team programs are, are never really going to achieve the level of patient safety that would be good if they're practicing outside or, you know, outside of a health system or structure. It's really hard because we look back on the Donabedian model of patient safety. Now, Avedis Donabedian was really considered the father of healthcare quality improvement, right? He wrote his initial textbooks back in the 1960s, but uh, amazing information, but it's still this gold standard of, of you know, healthcare quality improvement uh, as, as held up by the model by the WHO. So you have to have a process, you know, uh, kind of antecedent factors, but a, a structure through which to provide care, a designed process to provide that care, and then out, you know, outcome assessments of the patients. That's really almost impossible in the team model of healthcare that is often provided in, in poor communities. Mm. So that's probably a big barrier in the sense that I would say 95 or more percent of the problems that happen with those types of projects are a direct result of not working through a healthcare facility. So they could be eliminate, you could eliminate most of the problems if they did one thing, which is serve within the construct of a, of a functional hospital or program or health program or clinic where they're already providing healthcare. The other one is that kind of assumption we touched base on earlier. How do we, uh, you know, how do we focus on the quality, not the quantity of patients, especially in Christian healthcare? We've got to come back and, you know, or charitable healthcare as a whole, we got to come back and we've got to raise money from donors. So we have to say, look at all the patients that we saw and we cared for. So the number of patients becomes more important than the the quality of care that we provide. And I think if I was to say, what is, what is something that I wish we could create a mindset shift about? It's that, how do we focus as much on quality as we do on quantity? Mm. Mm. So we all work for an international Christian healthcare ministry. And some of us on this call specifically have an initiative to, uh, address some of these things that we're talking about. So, um, I, I was wondering if we could throw out some ideas. <laughs> um, what are some ways, especially with I2S, if you guys could explain a little bit about uh, that, that ministry, um, what are some ways that you guys have tried to address some of these challenges in healthcare and low resource settings? Yeah, um, Iron to Silver is um, the program initiative uh, started by Sarah and I and Really, the desire is to um, bridge the gap of some of these things that we've talked about today already. And uh, the idea comes behind the fact that um, iron, iron-based iron care, a lot of care given is, is iron. It's ironclad. People are showing up to work every single day. It's durable. It's strong. They're doing it. Um, but... <laughs> um, Sorry. little train coming through of the podcast. No problem. Um you know, and it's it's sustainable even, um, which which are all quality things. But at the same time, um, we 
a lot of times it's kept at that level because we feel discouraged that we can't give the Western gold standard of care, which is in medicine, what we learn is is the best for whatever we're talking about, whatever ailment or situation we're discussing. Um, and our initiative is trying to get behind the deals, it, the idea that we can we can always evaluate to do better, to, to reach for uh, the next level of care. And maybe that next level is the silver standard, which is a kind of a term we coined um, to create the idea that there there is a silver standard and that's a good quality standard. So if you can't reach the goal, it doesn't mean to stay where you're at, but there's always a next level to attain to. And the, the idea came from Isaiah 61, the Bible, where um, he's talking about the redemption of, of Israel. He says, I will turn your bronze to gold and your iron to silver. So we believe as as Christians that it's um, it's our imperative. It's it's really our, our duty as um, just as much of a duty as sharing the gospel with people is, is to go out there and evaluate their care we're given and to help people, help nationals, help global health workers um, meet the next level of care to be people centered and compassionate um, because they deserve our best. Sarah, what else am I missing in that? I'm sure I'm missing this. I mean, that was a pretty good description of, I think this is, um, well, I know this was a an idea that uh, came about over the last several years, actually, that we were on the field together. We were on the same field. I don't know if that was inferred by our earlier conversations, but um, we served together. So um, we kind of birthed this idea then and then came back and decided to uh, put it into practice. And we're still young. We're still trying to figure out exactly what this looks like. I think you know, coming back, we would have said, um, you know, our, our our ideal would be like small projects that are easy to implement and measure and get some results from. But everything we've done since we got back are enormous. And that's just kind of what's fallen in our in our lap so far. But, um, you know, I think even before we left, we helped a, um, a friend of ours improve their newborn care um, in an in a Asian country. You know, it was just they, she just recognized that she was in a women's and children hospital and their preemies weren't surviving at a level where they really should have been, you know, and she's like, I know something's wrong, you know, and I think um, that's the first step, right, <laughs> is it, admitting there's a problem or recognizing there's a problem. So um, she just came to us and said, I know something's wrong and I know you guys do good preemie care at your hospital. Can you help me? And she actually came to the hospital of Hope in Togo and kind of worked with us for a couple of weeks and kind of took our protocols back to her hospital and implemented them and did amazing um, M&E and um, things like that and really improved that survival rate in that hospital tremendously. I mean, you know, and it was just, it wasn't high tech. It wasn't expensive. It wasn't, we didn't give any money to make this happen. <laughs> it was just using what she had and using it in a different way. And I think that to us was, um, solidification of things can be replicated even in different countries and things like that. And it doesn't have to be high tech and high money. It can just be looking at what you have and uh, utilizing it in the best way and I, to, to improve a better outcome. And, you know, and I think you're coming from two people that spent a lot of years on the field and, you know, I would say several times a week could look at something and be like, man, I wish that was different. I wish I had time to tackle that or I wish I had time to tackle that. And, you know, and you just don't, you know, and I think that was another impetus to us starting this program was if we can come alongside you and help you at tackle something, then that's why we, what's what we want to do. We want to improve healthcare, even if it's on the minimal level or on the hospital wide level. Um, you know, and I think, research and analysis and things like that aren't everybody's people don't like it you know and I think we're a little nerdy and we like it you know and I think you know we both have um <laughs> have or are working on advanced degrees Kelly is um a numbers person math major numbers person she loves epidemiology so she crunches the numbers I'm more of a process person I got a public health degree and a disaster health degree. So like I do the processes and she does the numbers. So we kind of cover both of our bases here. But, you know, and I think just from our own experience in Togo, Kelly ran, started and ran a cancer program. So we have seen it work. And um, the last two years that I was in Togo, finally carved out the time at night, sometimes late at night on the weekends to pull a bunch of 
charts to to do a snake bite study because there's just not a lot of information on snake bite treatment in Africa, especially West Africa. And Kelly and I thought that would be we see we saw so many, but still, as much as I wanted to do it, carving the time out to make that happen was was hard, you know. And if somebody would have said, "Gosh, we'll come we'll come over and do that for you," I'd have been like, "Yep, come on over and do it." So um, yeah, that's a yeah. That's a great sales pitch for Iron Silver that we're going to crunch the numbers for you and, and do all the, to take that offer back. Yeah, I, I can't do math, so the, already you sold me. Yeah. Well, you got Kelly salivating when you say math and crunching numbers, so yeah. she's ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't Pi Day everyone's favorite day? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, but it's important to say that, like, we know that it's not a one size fits all. You know, we have protocols that we think worked. And even with our, um, you know, our colleague in Asia who we helped with preemies, you know, a year later, her numbers in a lot of ways looked better. But there was one category where they kind of looked worse. And we had to look and say, do you know what? What are things that in the protocol we use maybe isn't working for for your context there in Asia and your um the diseases that are there and the different bacteria that are attacking your babies there as far as antibiotics. And, and it's different. It's not medicine isn't a one size uh, fits all scenario, but that's why we continue to walk with her and say, OK, let's reevaluate these numbers or what part of the protocol culturally was difficult to implement. Um, maybe it was just getting people to be weighed every day. You know, there's culturally there's something going on there. And and how do we walk with people to say this isn't just send our protocol out to the nations and this should fix your problems. You know, um, we want to be there to kind of work through the nitty gritty of how we can apply these things to different settings. You know, I was excited when you guys came and wanted to join Christian Health Service Corps because this is a big piece of who we are as an organization and it just fits so well with with what we want to do in wherever we serve right is to build capacity and and to improve the quality of the care that we provide not just provide care but train uh, our our local colleagues in many instances through formal residency programs and how do we do the research how do we clearly uh, tell a story of of the work that's being done because I think especially in the Christian community there's so much great work that's being done, but the people doing the work are so busy they can't they can't tell that story they can't publish the research. So uh, I just thought this was such an amazing program and so excited to have you guys as part of Christian Health Service Corps uh, working on this initiative and. Uh, I can't wait to get you out and about more to do uh, to do more of this work. Thanks. We're excited to be a part of it. Yes, very. Yeah. Uh, is there any is there anything else that you guys would want to plug about Iron to Silver? Um, I, I know that we have a section on on your initiative on our website under what we do, quality improvement. It's healthservicecorps.org slash I2 as in the number two S. Yeah, I think it's just um, we're always happy to chat with people. There's many people that just say, can we Zoom call together and think up, you know, what possibilities? Um, a lot of our phone calls are just working through what people's resources are, getting those down on paper and just helping people understand what could their next step be. A lot of people don't necessarily know, like, I have this project and this is what I want to do. But some of it is just... Um, walking people through the basic steps of what could be the next best step. What is not, what is, um, how do I use the resources I already have that use them in a better way? Uh, that's always the first step we're going to want to take with people. It's uh, not going to be, you know, what's not a financial burden. What's not going to take, you know, 10 weeks of a training course that we have to pack up and go on a plane. What, what are things that your people already have strengths in? Maybe we're just not using those strengths or we're not using the resources you have um, to the capacity that they could be used. Yeah, I think another thing that um, Kelly and I both, I think, are extremely passionate about, uh, and I'm just going to throw us both under the bus a little bit here and say we would love to what we call run the list with people. You know, we've done it before um, with uh, CHSC missionaries or anybody that's participating in global health. Running the list, meaning we would love to run the patients with you to say, hey, I have a question about this. Can I can I bounce this off of somebody? Have you ever seen something like this? 
You know, and I think, again, touching back on the collaboration aspect of mission medicine, sometimes you just want reassurance that, okay, with what I have, I have this patient in front of me right now. It's not a QI project, but something's going on. Can you help me? And um, I know both of us are very willing to do that. I know we've done that with a couple of CHSC missionaries and our own uh, missionaries uh, that are still in Togo. Um, But we would love to do that with anybody that has um, the need for that. And, you know, even though we're on the Eastern or Central time zone, if you tell us you're calling, we'll we'll make sure we're awake or have our phones on so we can <laughs> so we can talk to you. Um, but um, we'll make our obviously, baby. I'm awake all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make our contact information available um, if you if you reach out to us for sure. So uh, we would love to do that for anybody that w- would have that need. Great. Awesome. Um, and I hope to hear more from all of you guys soon as our panel of hosts here. Uh, be looking forward to uh, more episodes of this CHSC podcast. In the future, we're going to have a ton of different guests. We already have so many different ideas for people we could have on and topics we could talk about. Uh, and I'm so grateful that all of you guys can join us today. We're excited. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Carter. Mm-hmm. All right. Hope to see you uh, in a couple of weeks. Bye, guys. Hey, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Christian Health Service Corps Iron to Silver podcast. You know, Christian Health Service Corps, we are passionate about bringing quality health care to the world's poorest places. If you share our passion, we'd love to hear from you. Our website is www.healthservicecorps.org. Thank you again for joining us this week.